How's it going everyone? We're coming up on the one year anniversary of the video I made talking about struggling with singleness in comparison as a Christian. And while some things like my gross beard have thankfully changed, other things like the fact that I'm still single have not. And so today I wanted to revisit the topic of singleness in the form of sharing with you the two most important things you need to know as a Christian in an unwanted season of singleness. These aren't tips on how to make someone fall in love with you or how to find the love of your life because I still don't have that information. Rather, they're two truths that you need to accept and internalize if you want to not only survive your singleness, but also truly model Christ in it, which we should all want. So these two truths have to do with how we as single people perceive the reason for our singleness. Because we're human, we feel the need to attribute a reason to everything that happens to us so that we feel more in control, even though some things like singleness might not actually have a reason. Like, the reason you're single might be very clear and obvious, like you're a jerk and no one wants to date you, but also you might not be a jerk and the reason you're single might only ever be known to God, and you'll never know it for yourself. Some things we're just not meant to know. But still, we come up with reasons, which, I have found, usually does more harm than good. Because finding a reason for why you're single essentially boils down to finding the one who's to blame for why you're single, which ends up being either someone else or yourself. Blame leads to resentment, resentment leads to harshness, harshness leads to callousness, and the spiral continues. And in the end, the reason you came up for why you're single actually just exacerbates the pain of singleness instead of alleviating it. So my goal here is to talk about the two most common reasons we give ourselves for why we're single, share why those reasons aren't good reasons, and replace them with biblical truths to live by. So the first reason you might have for why you're in an unwanted season of singleness puts the blame on someone else. That can refer to other people, but in this case, I'm referring to God because that's what I've seen happen more. And the reason you give yourself is, I'm single because God doesn't love me. But the truth is, and always has been, that God does love you even if he hasn't blessed you with a relationship. One of the biggest things God has taught me this past year regarding singleness is that singleness will be the death of you if you believe that you're single because God doesn't love you or because he doesn't care enough about you to give you what you want. I know this because every comment I've seen where someone has claimed that God isn't good because he hasn't given them a relationship is so cynical and hopeless. They just talk like God is a tyrant who's out to get them in life and they're the helpless victim underneath his thumb. Which is dangerous because God is a God of hope and joy. So when you vilify him, he's not going to be those things for you. And there's going to be a lot less hope and joy in your life. And it's like, I get it. I've been angry towards God because he hasn't blessed me with a wife yet plenty of times. And I believe he wants us to be honest with him about those feelings. But when you hold on to that anger so long that it leads you to believe that God just straight up doesn't love you, you need to take a step back and check which God you're actually following. The one who created you or the one you created out of your desire to be in a relationship. Someone had to say it. Because the truth is God does love you, even if he hasn't given you a husband or a wife yet. Even if he never gives you a husband or a wife, he loves you. Because his love for you isn't measured by whether or not he gives you a husband or a wife. His love for you is measured by how he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins so that we might be able to know him and have a relationship with him. I think it's easy for all of us to lose sight very quickly of the things God has done for us when we're only focused on the things he hasn't done for us. When the things he provides for us like food and health and a steady income seem guaranteed, we don't even think of them as blessings. We just think of them as the bare minimum. But look around the world and you'll see pretty quickly that those things aren't guaranteed. So every day we do wake up with food and health and a steady income, or even just wake up at all, is proof of God's love for us. We don't need a marriage partner to know that God loves us. But you can also look at the reason of I'm single because God doesn't love me from a different perspective. You see, the Bible says that if you burn with passion, you should get married. It also says that you shouldn't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So, assuming you do want to get married, you can't get married to just anyone. You have to marry someone who you're equally yoked with. Someone who's similar to you in their pursuit of becoming more like Jesus. And then on top of that, you don't want to marry someone who shares your convictions but you're not actually attracted to or you don't actually like being around. So you have to find someone who you're equally yoked with and who you're attracted to and who's attracted to you and who shares similar goals in life and who wants to commit to a relationship and, and, and. And it becomes obvious that following the biblical command to get married if you burn with passion is much easier in theory than in practice. 
And when you spend years praying for a godly spouse and putting yourself out there and going out on dates and doing everything right, but still the right person hasn't come along, it does become easier to see why people start to question God. Like, God, I'm burning with desire. I know I could serve you better if I had a partner and I don't want to give myself over to my lustful thoughts, so I know I need to get married. I know I need to find someone who I'm equally yoked with, so I'm involved in my church, I've had friends set me up on dates with their Christian friends, and I've even given dating apps a shot. I'm doing everything I can to obey your command and fulfill my desire to find a godly spouse, but still you haven't given one to me. It feels like you aren't hearing my prayers, or if you are, you just don't care. And after years, or for some people even decades, of having that conversation with God, it becomes easier and easier to think, well, God must not love me or at least not love me enough to hear the pain in my prayers and do something about it. And if that's you right now, I just want to say that my heart goes out to you. I know that that's a hurt that a lot of people don't see, and if they do see it, they don't understand. But I see it, and I understand it, and so does God. Psalm 34, 18 through 19 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. God is close to you when you cry out in pain, not far away. He will deliver you from your troubles, but you have to let him. You have to trust that he's not finished with you yet. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Truthfully, I don't know why God hasn't blessed you with a relationship yet. I don't know why he hasn't blessed me with a relationship yet. I don't know. But I do know that God is working all things together for my good. I know that this unwanted season of singleness, no matter how long it lasts, is being used by God for my good and His glory. I know that even though I'm single, even though God hasn't given me the thing I've prayed for, He still loves me more than I could ever know. And that's all I really need. So don't let your singleness kill you because you think God is out to get you or He doesn't love you. Because that's not true. The truth is he does love you and he does have a plan for you, even if he keeps you single longer than you'd like. All right, so that was the first truth to combat the lie we tell ourselves when we blame someone else for our singleness. Now it's time to look at the flip side of the coin and talk about when we focus our blame inward and blame ourselves for our singleness. Maybe you're like me and you're much quicker to blame yourself for anything than you are to blame God or anyone else. So when it comes to your singleness, the reason you give yourself is, I'm single because I'm I'm not good enough for someone to want to be with me. But the truth is that even though we are all broken, imperfect people, you are enough to be loved by others because you're made in the image of God. So yes, like I said, this is the reason that hits closer to home for me. A story to illustrate this would be earlier this year, I was talking with a girl. It was long distance, so we talked for like three months and eventually we met up and we went on a date and it was all fine and dandy and I thought it went well, we had a DTR, things were looking good. And then like a week later, she calls me up and says, Josiah, I really like you as a friend. And I was like, sick. And we stopped talking after that. So, you know, I was pretty upset. We had talked for three months and I expected it to turn into a relationship, but it didn't. So I was upset. So I called my brother just to talk through things. And I was like, hey, so-and-so and I aren't talking anymore. And one of the first things he said to me was, now, I know you're going to want to blame yourself for what happened and get in your own head about what you did to ruin things, but you can't do that. That's not healthy and that's not the truth. And when he said that, I almost started crying because that's exactly what I was doing. I immediately started asking myself, what about me was not good enough for this girl? Was I not funny enough? Was I not charismatic enough or good looking enough or religious enough even? And the conclusion I came to when I was in my own head like that was, yeah. I wasn't good enough. And then I looked back at all my past relationships and potential relationships that ended similarly with me asking myself, why wasn't I good enough? And my conclusion shifted from, I wasn't good enough for this one girl to, I'm not good enough for anyone. The common denominator in all my failed relationships is me, so what's wrong with me? That's what I said to myself when I was neck deep in emotions. Thankfully, with time and space, I was able to look back at everything a bit more objectively and say, okay, Maybe the reason this didn't work out wasn't my fault. Maybe it wasn't anybody's fault and it just wasn't meant to be. But in the immediate aftermath of having your heart broken or being friend zoned or whatever, it's easy to feel like you're not good enough for someone. And when that happens time and time again, it's easy to feel like you'll never be good enough for anyone. 
Or maybe the case for you is you've never even made it to that point. Maybe no guy has ever asked you out, or maybe no girl you've ever asked out has said yes. And so you ask yourself, what's wrong with me? Why am I not enough for someone to even want to take a chance on? And it can get to a point where we lie and we tell ourselves we're single because it's our fault, because we're not smart enough, or cool enough, or handsome enough, or pretty enough, or likable enough, or good enough to be loved by someone else. It's what we say, but it's exactly that, a lie. Now the Bible does say that we're not good. None of us are good. We're selfish, we're imperfect, and we're sinful. So in that sense, we could never be good enough for anyone because we're not good in general. But even in our not goodness or our not good enoughness, someone does choose to love us, and that someone is Christ. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were not good enough, while we were quite the opposite of good enough, Christ loved us enough to die for us. But why? Why would Christ do that for us? If we're as bad as the Bible says we are, then what does he see in us that makes us worth loving? Well, the answer to that is in Genesis 1.27. It says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God loves us because we are created in his image. Through nothing more than our being as humans, we reflect God. He is our father, we are his children, and a good father can't help but love his children. Christ died for us even while we were sinning against him because he knew his death would allow us to approach our heavenly father and be in full relationship with him. He counted the cost and knew that for God's image bearers, it was worth it. So at the end of the day, that must mean that being made in the image of God is pretty important. It means that as someone who bears likeness to the creator of the world, you have a place in the world. It means that you are valuable. It means that you have the capacity to do great things. It means that you were created with intentionality, that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Basically, it means you're special, even when you don't feel like it. Not because of anything you've done, but because of the one who chooses to call you his own. So the next time you're looking at yourself in the mirror, or you're lying awake in bed at night, or you're fighting to make sense of things after having your heart broken, and you're asking yourself, am I just not good enough for anyone? The answer is no, none of us are, but you're made in the image of God, and that's all the reason he needed to love you. So that's all the reason we need to love others, and that's all the reason we need to be loved by others. So again, I don't know why you're single. Maybe there are some very clear areas in your life you need to work on before God will bless you with a relationship. Maybe he's using your singleness to be a blessing to others. Maybe, again, there is no discernible reason. I don't know. But I do know that you're not single because you're unlovable, or because there's nothing in you that's worthy of someone's love. You are lovable, and the fact that you're made in God's image means you are worthy of love. And for that reason, if it's in God's will, the right person will come along and say to you, you are enough. But even in our singleness, no matter how long it lasts, we are still loved and we are still called enough in Christ. If you struggle to believe that, then my prayer for you is that God reveals himself to you and through that revelation, you see how valuable you really are. So to finish up, the two most important truths you need to know and trust as a Christian in an unwanted season of singleness are, one, God loves you even if he hasn't blessed you with a relationship, and two, you are enough to be loved by others because you're made in the image of God. I hope this video was encouraging for you and that you're able to take these biblical truths and truly allow them to change the way you view your singleness. Even for me, doing the research for and writing this video was super helpful in reframing how I view my own singleness, which I definitely still struggle with from time to time. If the video was helpful for you, please like and subscribe, share it with someone who needs to hear it, and go ahead and share in the comments any other important truths that us single Christians need to hear. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all very much. And I will see you in the next one.